It's obviously a pleasure for me to talk about melatonin. As Jan said, before most of you were born, I was already investigating it. And then your next question is, how old is this guy? He's old. <laughs> but he takes melatonin. I'm not going to make any claims about definitively deferring aging, albeit melatonin certainly delays, potentially prevents a variety of age-related conditions. And that's what we're going to discuss today. The role of melatonin itself, as well as as a chronobiotic, a biological rhythm generator. Two things have become very important. Many things are important. But in the context of this discussion, two things. It's antioxidant activity, which is extremely powerful, far exceeding the antioxidant potential of classically known antioxidants such as vitamin C, vitamin E, flavonoids, and so forth. I will not spend a great deal of time talking about the free radical or the antioxidant activity of melatonin, but it is, we know now, very relevant. The other thing is melatonin itself exhibits a circadian rhythm, a 24-hour cycle that influences circadian biology more generally, and that will be the primary discussion that we're going to consider today. Over evolution of humans at least four million years, but even before that, all organisms were exposed to a regularly changing light-dark environment determined by the rising and the setting of the sun. It was either dark or light, depending upon whether it was in fact day or night. What this discussion is going to be is how humans have subverted terribly our photoperiodic environment and the consequences of light at night. During our evolution, we were never exposed to light at night like we have now. And that is impacting severely our ability to produce melatonin, as I will show you, and our circadian biology, both of which are absolutely essential for optimal health. Whether we're talking about reproductive biology, whether we're talking about neurobiology, whether we're talking about dermatology, whether we're talking about gastrointestinal physiology. Rhythms are important. And that's what this slide emphasizes. During the course of evolution of humans, or humanoids if you prefer, but even before that, the light-dark cycle is what it is today, and humans and all animals developed a clock in the brain. It's called a suprachiasmatic nucleus. You have one. I have one. Your dog has one. The rats have one. All species have a biological clock in their brain. To illustrate how important circadian biology is, I remind you with this slide that everything, every system in your body exhibits a 24-hour cycle. In fact, 10 to 15 percent of all the genes in every cell throughout your body, regardless of where that cell is, are dedicated to circadian rhythms. So every cell in your body exhibits circadian rhythms, and to function normally, they have to be in synchrony. And they receive this information from the light-dark cycle, but your liver cannot see. How does it know when it's day? How does it know when it's night? If it can read the melatonin message, it knows perfectly whether it's dark or light. But I remind you, Dark is no longer dark. If you live anywhere in a city throughout the world. But here again, for example, at noon, serum cholesterol peaks. Right now your cholesterol is highest because everything exhibits a rhythm. 
Early in the morning, your chances of heart attack were greatest. Fortunately, we passed that for today. But birth of a children, birth of a child, is usually late during the dark phase. Albeit again, that is changing by virtue of the fact that we are mismanaging light. This is melatonin, N-acetyl-5-methoxytryptamine. I remind you that it's not unique to humans. It's not unique to mammals. It's in amphibians, birds, reptiles, cockroaches, insects, spiders, unicellular organisms, bacteria, plants. Every plant that has been studied contains melatonin. Every organism that contains melatonin. Illustrating again the potential importance of this molecule. There is no species that's been identified that does not contain melatonin, plant or animal. And of course, in humans and in all vertebrate species, it exhibits a 24-hour rhythm, and I'll show you what that rhythm looks like. It's involved in sleep-wake. You know melatonin is related to sleep-wake cycle. It's taken frequently for sleep, successful sleep to overcome jet lag. That's how it was originally used. But its effects far exceed, very far exceed, its ability to influence the sleep weight cycle. There's also something called, when you think of jet lag, you think of going across transmeridian travel. Many of you experience jet lag when you stay at home. I'll give you an example. During the week, you're working, so you go to bed at 11 o'clock, get up at 7 or whatever. But come weekend, you say, well, I think I'll stay up until 2 or 3 in the morning. Yeah, party, man. That's called social jet lag. You are desynchronized by virtue of the fact that you are altering your circadian biology on a weekly basis. And then you have night shift workers. One third. One third of the workers in the world work night shift. They have severely disrupted circadian biology. And there is a price to pay. It does not come without a charge. This is what your melatonin levels look like. During the day, all of you have very low values. Noon, one o'clock. I could take a blood sample from all of you right now, and I could not distinguish one from another in terms of your levels of melatonin. Conversely, at night, with the onset of darkness, and darkness is a requirement, sleep is not. Melatonin promotes sleep, but sleep does not promote melatonin. Darkness promotes melatonin. And melatonin levels rise, stay elevated for the duration of the darkness, anticipate lights on if you have a normal duration of darkness, and come back to daytime levels. There are, however, great differences in terms of the amplitude of the nighttime peak. If you have a high amplitude peak, that suggests your circadian rhythms are very strong, that's good. But even some young people have a very attenuated nocturnal peak. Really a weak signal to signal these very important circadian events. This rhythm is reproduced with great fidelity from one night to the next. It's genetically determined, so if you are a weak producer, you generally are a weak producer every night. This melatonin comes from the pineal gland in the brain. I'll show you where the pineal gland is momentarily. It's not the only, or excuse me, it's not the only organ that produces melatonin. Many cells in the body produce melatonin. The pineal gland is the only organ that releases it into the blood to provide circadian information to all cells that can read the message. And all cells seem to be capable of reading that signal. There's no way your urinary bladder would know if it's light or darkness unless there's some message it's receiving. That message is right here. The problem is, I've already mentioned, that humans are relatively melatonin deficient. I'll give you an example. Take a group of humans and put them in light for 16 hours 
and eight hours of darkness per 24-hour period, which if you sleep eight hours a night, that's the time you're in darkness. The only reason I mention sleep here is typically the only time we are in darkness. The only time we sh not should be, we should be in more darkness. But hopefully you are in darkness when you sleep. But that's not so easy to accomplish either. But under those conditions, at the duration of elevated melatonin, take that same group of individuals and put them in a light-dark cycle of 10 hours of light and 14 hours of darkness, duration of melatonin is much longer. But nobody, few of you ever, are exposed to 14 hours of darkness per day. And you say, well, that's an abnormal photo period. Austria, on December 21st, 15 hours of darkness, 9 hours of light. If we didn't have artificial light, you would be producing much more melatonin than you are now. Even during the summer, the longest days, you still have 9 hours of darkness and 14 hours of light. But how many of you ever experienced nine hours of darkness on a regular basis? I suspect very few. It gets worse. These, this is a, this is a period of darkness, the light area is a period of darkness. Normally, melatonin goes up, remains elevated for the duration of darkness, but if you turn on a light at night, which I implore you never, as never, not sometimes, never. You were never allowed to do it during evolution, and here we are. You turn on a light tonight at 2 o'clock in the morning, and you said, I just heard a lecture, Russ Ryder said I shouldn't do that. Way too late. Your brain is not stupid. It recognizes light when it sees it, and it tells the gland, no more melatonin, and the lack of melatonin desynchronizes every cell in your body. So you're immediately desynchronized. There are consequences, numerous, in terms of many physiological events. The degree of inhibition is proportional to the brightness of that light. The brighter the light, the more the suppression, the more the circadian rhythm disturbance. Avoid light minimally. Avoid light once you go to bed at night. If you have to get up, like sometimes I have to, as an old timer, I can do it without turning on a light. No matter where I am in the world, I can negotiate my trek right to where I have to go. Avoid light after darkness onset. And hopefully even some other time. All light is not the same. We can have light at night, but in the visible electromagnetic radiation, it's really these wavelengths, the blue wavelengths of light, that are detected by very unique photoreceptors in the retina. Not your rods and cones mediate the circadian effects of light. It's what I refer to as intrinsically photoreceptor ganglion cells. There are relatively fewer ganglion cells than rods and cones to begin with, and only 1 to 2% of those have a unique photopigment called melanopsin, which detects blue waves of length exclusively that is transferred to your clock and transferred to the pineal gland. The problem is white lights contain blue, green, yellow, red, all these wavelengths are contained in white light. So when you turn on a white light, you are, in fact, getting blue wavelengths which are impacting your circadian biology. Okay, so what? So light impacts your circadian biology. Give me an example why that's bad. I'll give you several examples, one of which is here. In 2006, Science News is a publication of the National Institutes of Health in the United States that determines, gives advice on health issues. And you'll notice what it says here, nightlight on cancer. What's all this about? Nightlight and cancer? 
Well, let's see what it says. Bright light, big cancer. Melatonin depleted blood. Melatonin depleted blood by light at night enhances the likelihood of certain types of cancer. We now know it applies to many cancers. Originally demonstrated in reference to breast cancer, which is primarily a female-related disease, although not exclusively. But what I want to talk about is primarily breast cancer in females, albeit applies to leiomyoma, cancer of the skin, hepatocellular carcinoma, Many cancers respond to melatonin, and particularly grow more aggressively when you do not have adequate amounts of melatonin. And the reason we don't have adequate amounts, I've already explained to you. Light pollution is the major factor that is suppressing our melatonin levels and disturbing our circadian biology. David is a former student of mine, and here they quote him. Breast cancers are awake during the day and sleep at night. And I'll show you what that means. That is not a trivial statement. We demonstrate this in the following way. You can grow human cancer cells in animals if they're immune compromised. So we had Human MCF7 breast cancer cells, human breast cancer cells, growing in animals. And we kept them in an environment where we had 12 hours of light by this light source A, and 12 hours of darkness. So they own a 12-12 light dark cycle. Except we had a second bulb called B, where we could regulate the intensity of light pollution at night. It was real statically controlled, so we could give them a little overriding light at night, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Simulating what you might have in a city, in Vienna, in Munich, wherever. What happens under these conditions, there's tumors growing in there, and this is the growth of the tumor, human breast cancer cells, under a light-dark cycle of 12-12, where you have, in fact, 12 hours of darkness, true darkness. But if that, light, if that darkness is contaminated by a little bit of light, all of a sudden those tumors grow faster. And the brighter that light at night, the faster those cancers grow. And it's proportional to the degree by which you are inhibiting melatonin. This is a melatonin circadian effect, the consequence of which is faster tumor growth. I'll show you many more data from these studies, but there are not, there is not sufficient time within a week to give you all the data. I'm not going to talk a week, I don't think. No, I won't talk a week. Here we know this one is, one thing that is happening we know very clearly. This again is a period of darkness, and this is your blood levels of melatonin. I remind you, it goes up at night. You want it to go up at night and you want to stay up all night. I've told you one way to avoid that. What happens during the daytime, these cancers take up an omega fat called linoleic acid. Unfortunately, in a Western diet, linoleic acid is much more common than it should be, and it's a bad fat. Linoleic omega-6, bad fat. But you notice it's high during the day, and as soon as melatonin begins to go up, these tumors can't take it up anymore. I'll give you the mechanism. We understand how and when. And as melatonin drops, linoleic acid goes up. So these tumors are exhibiting a circadian rhythm in linoleic acid uptake. It is converted to something called 13 hydroxy octadecadienoic acid. I'm going to refer to it as a hode throughout the rest of the presentation. But for the exam at the end of this discussion, I'll ask you about 13 hydroxy octadecan, so you better write it down. But I'm gonna to refer to it as HOD. Linoleic acid is converted to HOD, and we understand the mechanism, I'll show you those. And this 
induces the phosphor activation of kinases which cause cellular proliferation. If you can avoid the uptake of linoleic acid, you can do a very significant benefit in terms of inhibiting the growth of this type of tumor. And again, I'll show you that. Another graduate student, Bud Brainerd. We used a Gansfield dome, represented here, where during the middle of the night we can very carefully regulate the intensity of light or the wavelengths. In other words, we can expose the blue light, green light, yellow light, red light, any color light you want. In the middle of the night, after these individuals have been in darkness, we take a blood sample and their melatonin levels are high. Of course, they've been in darkness. We then put them in front of the Ganfield Dome, expose the light, and after a period of time, take some blood and see how much melatonin is depleted, and we can virtually titrate the precise melatonin levels we want by either regulating the intensity or the wavelength of light. You then take that blood, and we can measure the melatonin levels in that blood, and you perfuse it over breast cancer cells growing in animals, human breast cancer cells growing in animals. The melatonin levels during the day are low from these individuals. At night they increase, of course. Then you expose the light, and we're going to talk about light where you only suppress nighttime levels by about half. As if you are one of these individuals. There are some of you that only produce that much melatonin normally at night. You take those blood samples and fuse them over the tumors. We've done it with hepatoma, rat, and human breast cancer cells. And again, I'm going to give you indices of tumor growth. Cyclic AMP, linoleic acid uptake, 13 hydroxyoctadecadienoic acid, which causes the growth, and uptake of tritiate thymidine, in other words, DNA synthesis for cell renewal. And if you take daytime blood, very active, very, very active. Your tumors are much more active during the day than they are at night. At night, you take, you take this blood and infuse it over tumors, and they shut down. They say, got melatonin here? We're going to put a quietus on this real fast. But if you depress your levels of melatonin, you don't have to depress them all the way. Only partially, now again, these tumors are stimulated. You say, well, maybe it's not melatonin in the blood. Maybe it's something else. It is melatonin. If you add melatonin to this blood to bring it up to nighttime, higher nighttime levels, now the tumors are shut down. It is, in fact, melatonin in your blood that is capable of reducing the growth of these tumors. And if you give a melatonin receptor blocker so the melatonin can't act, the tumors again go wild. So we know in this case, at least this part of it, is a receptor-mediated event. Membrane receptors, we understand membrane receptors for melatonin. They exist in virtually every cell, and that's how the cells are reading the melatonin message, virtually every cell. No matter what you measure, these tumors are more active during the day than they are at night. Here's the danger of polluting your nighttime with light. This is a light-dark cycle, with this period of darkness being, in fact, dark. This red bar means we polluted that night with some light. So this red refers to these lines. This black refers to these rhythms. And here we have cyclic AMP, which is a signal transducer in these tumors, fatty, total fatty acid, but linoleic acid, and 13 hode. As you can see, during the day, every one of these parameters in the tumor is high. And they go down at night due to melatonin. But look what happens if you pollute the darkness with light. Now your melatonin is suppressed. These tumors run wild. They grow out of control. Not unique to breast cancer. Not 
unique to breast cancer. Prostate cancer, leiomyoma, melanoma, not all have been tested, but a number have. And they all show the same variation over a 24 hour period and the problem with pollution at night. Here's some of the things that are happening. It's actually much more complex than this. We have much more information than I can discuss within this interval. During the daytime, you have very little melatonin. The melatonin receptors are there, but there's very little melatonin to act on. The cells have a fatty acid transport pore and linoleic acid, which is high in our diet, is rapidly taken up by 15 lipoxygenase, it's converted to 13 hydroxyoctadec, 13 HODE. That phosphoactivates a number of kinases that cause cell proliferation and this phenomenon of the Warburg effect, aerobic glycolysis, which tumors also experience. Again, I don't have time to talk about the effects of aerobic glycolysis or the Warburg effect of melatonin, but melatonin affects that just as dramatically. And what happens then? These cells during the day are much more active. At night, you have melatonin. Hopefully you have melatonin. If you are in darkness, you have melatonin. If you are genetically programmed to produce enough melatonin. The implication is that maybe younger individuals with an attenuated nighttime melatonin rise, this may be a biomarker for the likelihood of developing a subsequent neoplasm. Melatonin is involved in cancer initiation, cancer promotion, and metastasis. Again, I cannot show you all these data, but it's truly remarkable how high efficacy this agent has. During darkness, melatonin acts on these receptors inhibits cyclic AMP, closes that pore. So linoleic acid does not get in, so there's relatively th little 13 hood, there's little phosphorylation of the kinases, and cell proliferation is shut down. I remind you we do not experience enough darkness that our ancestors did before 1879, when the light bulb was invented. I'll show you these tumors. They're growing in the inguinal region of that. This is a tumor, big tumor. Growing in this situation with darkness, with light exposure at night. Darkness contaminated by light. At 28 days of age, these are the tumors, human breast cancer cells, and this is the animal's in 12 hours in, of darkness and 12 hours light, where it is in fact dark. You can barely see those tumors. You can see them a little bit, but there's nothing compared to bad light. There's good light and a bad light. Good light in the day, bad light at night. We know it's melatonin. Again, if you substitute these animals with melatonin, MLT, melatonin, tumors don't grow. It's in fact melatonin that is being perturbed by light at night. That is consequential in the response of these tumors to growth mediating effects. This is only one of many met metabolic parameters that we have measured in these cells. We've measured antioxidant potential, prooxidant potential. A lot of things go on in these tumors that are mediated by melatonin. Even gets more interesting. Tumors, breast cancer, sometimes comes non-responsive to tamoxifen. Prostate tumors sometimes come non-responsive. They become non-responsive apparently because their rhythms are desynchronized. 
This field has opened up remarkably only in the last five years. You can increase or overcome the insensitivity of those tumors by giving them something that regulates their circadian rhythms. What is that something? Melatonin. Response to tamoxifen to tumors that are otherwise insensitive. If you give them melatonin, they now become sensitive to moxifen, or doxorubicin if you want to talk about some other tumors. Unfortunately, this information has hardly been applied at all to the human situation. Here you are. That's what it looks like. You've all seen this figure. But no matter where you live, Johannesburg, Manila, Dubai, Europe, Japan, high population density, organized societies, Eastern United States, night has disappeared. There is a price to pay in terms of our circadian biology. Not going to get any better. Oh, I just, I don't know. We all violate it. Look at this. You've all done it? Yeah, there you go. Thank you very much. I just want to show you the Trans-Siberian Railroad you can even identify because all the villages in Siberia are along the highway, are along the railroad. There's nothing you can't identify from space at night because of life. San Antonio, Texas, where I'm from. Same problem. Make any difference. We all violate it. How many of you are guilty of this, even after you turn out the lights at night? Light is light is light. If it contains blue wavelengths, we could have light at night. It's very expensive to remove specific wavelengths of light from one white light. But there are already goggles, blue filtering goggles. Maybe you should wear eye patches when you go to bed at night. But if you do that, you can't take them off until you get up in the morning. You can't say, I want to see what time it is. Your brain is not stupid. It knows what light is. It's been tell, told during its entire evolution that light means day and there's no exception. And you inhibit your melatonin and alter your circadian biology. I'm often asked about moonlight. Moonlight, you understand, is yellow-red wavelengths. No blue. Moonlight does not impact. I grew up in Minnesota, northern United States, where in the middle of the winter, if there was snow on the ground, it was a bright moonlit night. It was bright. Make any difference. Moonlight is the wrong wavelengths to inhibit your melatonin. So you don't have to worry about moonlight, but you do have to worry about night lights. Children with night lights. Children who are allowed to sleep with the TV on because they fall asleep with it on, the parents don't turn it off. Maybe the parents should be incarcerated. There's a big price to pay. I remind you again, blue light is worse. Blue light is far worse than red light. You all have gadgets in your room at night. You saw at the end of night, there is indeed an end to darkness, if you live any place. This is an article I wrote for Critical Reviews in Oncogenesis in 2007, and you can see the world, a city, and light pollution. And what it says is, cancer is likely. <coughs> International Agency for Cancer Research classifies light at night as a class 2A carcinogen. The World Health Organization knows it. Unfortunately, melatonin is not, not exploited to the degree it should be by any stretch of the imagination, considering its widespread benefits. Hanahan, in 2011, 
classified the major features of cancer. Telomerase activity goes up in cancer cells to renew their telomeres, so these cells eventually become immortalized, essentially. What do you imagine melatonin does to telomerase activity in cancer cells? It inhibits them. It won't allow cancer cells to synthesize or to lengthen their telomeres. Angiogenesis. Very Jeff. Melatonin is a remarkable, remarkable inhibitor of angiogenesis. Tumor cells, tumors, generally need a good blood supply for oxygen and so forth and nutrients. And if you deprive them, in other words, a lot of drugs are designed to deprive tumors of their blood vessel growth. And in fact, melatonin does that very well. It inhibits angiogenesis. It inhibits most of the things that are required. Aerobic glycolysis, right here. The Warburg effect depends on melatonin. The Warburg is much more active during the day than it is at night. We've measured that. Glucose uptake is much greater during the day, and lactate production is much greater during the day than at night. That's Warburg. Melatonin really shuts these tumors down. Not unique to breast cancer. Unfortunately, it gets worse. Here you are. You're all in this category. I'm, I'm moving up a little bit. <laughs> but even if you're in this category, you may be here. So far as we know, that's not good. You want a robust melatonin rhythm. High levels every night. Everything suggests in animal studies, in human studies, that more melatonin at night, a good robust melatonin rhythm is very important. For optimal health, not only in cancer, diabetes, free radical related diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinsonism, very high free radical related conditions, and melatonin is a very excellent scavenger by multiple means. You will be here, and unfortunately, Hopefully, actually, hopefully we'll all be here. Well, I'm essentially there now. But that's not my melatonin rhythm, I can assure you. You know what I do. Absolutely. For 23 years. And the plan is to keep doing it. Also, osteoporosis. There's a clinical trial on osteoporosis in melatonin. For one year only giving melatonin, the bone mineral density of the neck of the head of the femur, which is often broken in osteoporotic patients, and the spine is increased in those individuals on melatonin. Melatonin delays ovarian aging. We have a paper in press on that. Melatonin is very important for ovulation. Protecting the ovum from oxidative damage, which it experiences a lot of during ovulation. A very high free radical environment during ovulation. Again, we all know about sleep and melatonin benefits in sleep, but melatonin is not a soporific per se. It's a circadian rhythm generator regulator which allows normal sleep to occur. In other words, when melatonin is used for sleep, it's not knocking you out like prescription drugs. It's a normal sleep that is permitted by regulating your circadian rhythm. If melatonin is taken, it's taken just before bedtime, of course, because melatonin is normally high at night. So you, there are many, many, many clinical studies on improvement of sleep in elderly people. And sleep itself is beneficial to our overall health, clearly. There are a number of preparations available, of course. When you're young, which you all are, have a nice nighttime rise of melatonin, stays elevated for the first night. But as you get old, which is the case with me, now your melatonin levels are greatly decreased at night, but you can do something about it. And I have done something about it for many years. And I'm gonna to continue to do something about it because I know what melatonin does. 
Remember, I was doing this before you were born. This is not trivial stuff. There are fast-release pellets, tablets that produce a high level early in the darkness. Not optimal. Slow release that what you want is something that gives you something reminiscent of a normal pattern of release at night. Prolonged release or sustained release. Those products are probably the most beneficial in terms of successful, I don't want to say aging per se, but su successful prevention of age-related deterioration. I don't know if I'll live longer, but I'm going to try to live healthier. When I die, I want people to say, what did he die from? I died from nothing. I just died. I said, well, you must have had something. No, I had nothing. Just died. Got old and died. That's how I want to die. There are no guarantees, of course, but I'm doing what I can. There are things you should avoid beyond light. Light at night is the worst. If you can avoid aging, avoid that, because your melatonin levels diminish. Alcohol consumption late at night, especially late in the evening. I don't mean one drink. I mean alcohol consumption. That may inhibit your nighttime levels of melatonin. Caffeine. A lot of caffeine late at night. Again, there are variations in the literature, but these, but drugs, if you're hypertensive, a lot of people who are hypertensive are beta adrenergic blocking agents. The mechanisms of melatonin production in the pineal gland at night involve the release of norepinephrine acting on beta adrenergic receptors. So if you're taking beta adrenergic blockers, I can assure you, you have no melatonin rhythm. I can assure you of that. That's been amply demonstrated. You do well, but again, beta blockers are conventional in hypertensive patients. Also, your blood pressure drops at night during sleep. If you have a nighttime rise of melatonin, there are, called, there are people called non-dippers who do not decrease their melatonin, their blood pressure at night. They don't have a melatonin rhythm. You give them melatonin, they dip. So your mean pressure throughout a 24-hour day also varies, is lower when you have an ample melatonin rhythm. Heart rate, same thing. NSAIDs, aspirin does not, does not impact your ability to produce. NSAIDs, however, is toxic. I mean, aspirin, you understand, is toxic. 700 people die in the United States every year from aspirin toxicity. 700, and people say, ah, just 700 people. 10,000 are admitted to emergency rooms with gastric hemorrhage. Nobody says anything about it. Perfectly acceptable. And what do you imagine the toxicity you do to? Free radicals. There are clinical studies showing that aspirin toxicity is prevented by what? Absolutely, by melatonin. Ibuprofen. If you want to damage your liver, take six, seven hundred milligrams of ibuprofen. In animals, absolutely can be prevented by melatonin. Renal toxicity. Doxorubicin kills your heart via free radicals. A lot of mitochondria in your heart. 30% of the volume of the, the, these cells is mitochondria. Mitochondria where free radicals are generated. During oxfos, you get a lot of leakage of electrons, reduction of nearby oxygen, free radicals. How do you imagine you prevent doxorubicin toxicity? Absolutely. Which means doxorubicin is limited, dose limited by its toxicity. It's a good anti-cancer agent, but it's limited because it's killing other organs. Give melatonin, melatonin is also anti-cancer agent, prevents the toxicity of doxorubicin, up the dose of doxorubicin, further killing the tumors. Not exploited, not exploited. Melatonin is non-patentable, inexpensive, no interest. 
at certain levels. They can't patent it, can't make any money. If you take melatonin, buy melatonin, I do not sell melatonin, I do not make melatonin, I do not make money off of melatonin. There are a lot of patents, use patents, use patents which are almost worthless, use patents on melatonin, I have none. I don't want any patents on melatonin because it would impact, I think, my interpretation of the data. So, I have no vested interest per se in melatonin. I have a vested interest in its use to improve health, and I hope you take this information with you and use it for you and or your patients, whatever the case may be, but it won't benefit me if you do or don't. I do not sell melatonin or anything else. Incredibly safe. It's been examined by pharmaceutical industry, of course. They've made analogs, just a lot of the analogs of melatonin that they sell, because they can patent them. But they're not melatonin. They don't do what melatonin does. They don't have all the benefits of melatonin. There's half a, more than half a dozen. There's 10 or 12 different companies that sell in what I call melatonin wannabes. They really wish they were melatonin, but they're not. They're not. You can prescribe them. They're approved. But they won't do what melatonin does. One, as an example, Eli Lilly is a big pharmaceutical company in Indianapolis in the United States. And one of their scientists, a number of years ago already, mentioned that melatonin was the least toxic molecule that they've ever tested in their paradigms. You cannot do an LD50 for melatonin. You cannot kill an animal or make an animal sick by giving them too much melatonin. You can kill them with aspirin. You can kill them with any drug. You can drown them in water. Can't do it with melatonin. The safety of melatonin over such a wide range of doses is very high. I'm not saying under some conditions, sometimes, somewhere, <coughs> maybe melatonin would have some toxicity. It's not perfect, although it's as near perfect as I can tell a molecule to be. High amplitude nocturnal melatonin peaks strengthen circadian rhythms and certainly correlates with optimal health. I've been to a variety of circadian rhythm meetings in the last couple of years because that's becoming also a big deal. And melatonin, circadian biology for optimal health, very important. But I remind you, wherever you live, lest you live in a cave without any light sources, you are compromising your ability to produce it. Do not overlook light pollution as a contributing fa factor to cancer, initiation, progression, or metastasis. I didn't give you all the data, I couldn't. And many other diseases. Circadian biology, which melatonin induces, which cells depend on for a signal to know when it's light or darkness. I remind you that 10 to 15% of the genes in every one of your cells is circadian based. It depends on a message from somewhere. And we are depriving ourselves of that message with either low amplitude genetically or due to light pollution or due to drugs we are taking or due to the fact that we do not spend enough time in darkness. I told you, 14 hours of darkness is not unusual in Central Europe on December 21st. Melatonin, because its function as a potent radical scavenger, I didn't talk a lot about this, reduces hepatic and uh, renal toxicity due to statins, st rhabdomyolysis. You take statins and you get, well, my, Muscles, Jesus, they're hurting all the time. Very serious condition if it progresses. Free radicals. There's studies in the literature showing that 
Free radical damage to muscles due to statins is prevented by giving the animals melatonin. I don't want you leaving here and saying melatonin is perfect or a miracle molecule. No. It's just an average, hard-working, good, wholesome molecule that is available, it's non-toxic, and we produce it, but we are producing less and less. It even comes into play, there's a lot of animals that cohabitate in cities with humans. They're exposed to light. There's already evidence. A beautiful study from Sydney, Australia on wallabies living under city lighting and those living in the forest, they function very differently. So it's not only affecting us, but the animals running around the city as well. Your dog, your cat, but your children. Night lights, all kinds of equipment that gives off light at night. I just leave you with this. If you want more information, you can consult many sources. These are some of them. I remind you, melatonin is available, and that's not a recommendation. I'm not here to tell you to take melatonin. If you ask me if I take it, I say, of course I take it. I've been investigating it forever. I know what it does. But your health is your business. I am not here to badger you to take melatonin. Don't go away from here saying it's a miracle molecule and he told me to take it. No. That's your choice. You do what you want to do. It's available. I take it. And if you are 45 years of age and do not, don't come, come complaining to me. Thank you very much. <laughs>